Uh, now, let's begin with our presentation titled Why Too Much Open Urban Space is a Bad Thing with Professor Robert Ellickson, followed by Professor Hillel Schaffen. Uh, Professor Ellickson is Walter E. Mayer Professor of Property and Urban Law Emeritus at, at Yale Law School. Professor Schaffen is a retired associate professor of architecture at the Azraeli School of Architecture at Tel Aviv University. And if you're ready to present, just let Chelsea know. Um, uh, first off, yeah. I congratulate uh, Senator Chang for putting together this extremely uh, international panel. Uh, um, I think how economists actually have the best analysis of many of the issues that we'll be talking about. Um, and they would agree with this uh, general proposition that the way to reduce housing prices, which of course are very, very high in Hawaii, uh, is to uh, 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 regulate less, uh, it's, it's to allow much more production of housing. Uh, Hawaii is famous uh, uh, nationally for uh, being very restrictive since the 1960s in the production of housing uh, through overregulation. I'm not in favor of zero regulation, I should say, of housing, uh, but I do, I think uh, that housing is overregulated over uh, in Hawaii. Uh, I, I cite a couple of, of sources here for the academic types. Uh, 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 one of them, uh, a great title here uh, by Vicki Bean et al, uh, Supply Skepticism. Uh, Vicki Bean and her co-authors are not supply skeptics. In fact, they think that more housing production would reduce uh, prices. Uh, Evan Mast, who will be joining the economics department at Notre Dame uh, University uh, this fall, uh, uh, has written, I think, uh, the most useful paper about these issues uh, and, and, and st states that uh, even the production of luxury housing uh, tends to reduce prices in uh, a, a lower income uh, housing markets. Uh, this might be surprising to some people, uh, but uh, there's, there's, a, there's a widespread uh, agreement among uh, economists. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Chelsea. Uh, in uh, Hawaii, uh, I assume uh, that uh, housing prices are in fact much higher in Honolulu than elsewhere. Uh, and then the, that raises the question about why the people or why are people willing to, to go to Honolulu to pay those uh, prices. Uh, and there are, of course, some downsides to uh, uh, not only uh, high prices, uh, high housing prices, uh, but also um, uh, COVID uh, problems and whatever uh, living in a big city. Uh, but on the, on the current theory uh, from urban economists is so-called agglomeration theory. And they have an explanation for uh, why uh, people uh, uh, want to live in a place like Honolulu. Um, and uh, so let me briefly go through these. Uh, the, the main thing is that you have uh, lower transportation costs when you will live near other people. You have more Uber Eats options to use a simple example here. Um, uh, number two here is that I, on the slide is ex extremely important, uh, which is that universities tend to be in uh, big cities. Um, uh, sports stadia tend to be in big cities. Uh, and the reason is that uh, you can have more specialized capital uh, in, in a big city. Uh, more, most importantly, uh, labor is more specialized in a big city. Uh, this is where you find uh, uh, fancy law firms, uh, IT specialists, and, and so forth. Uh, and uh, uh, people benefit from, 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 uh, from living in a neighborhood where you have these kinds of specialists. Uh, the third item here is information spillovers. Uh, uh, people learn from one another. Uh, and there's a great paper about uh, uh, the benefits of, if you were an author, a uh, novelist, uh, of, of going to London. Uh, this turned out to be a, uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, perhaps uh, uh, status uh, competition and so forth, uh, turned out to be a winner for uh, economists. So I give you a couple of, uh, of citations there to sources here. And for those of you who are academically inclined, you can find David Schleicher's 
piece, I think, is quite accessible uh, to you. Uh, next slide, please, Chelsea. Uh, this is more directly connected to uh, one of the topics uh, uh, of, of, of my particular panel, uh, which is uh, I'm, I'm in favor of open space. I think Manhattan had too little of it, uh, and they rightly uh, in, decided in the mid-19th century uh, to open Central Park uh, because they had planned for too little uh, open space. On the other hand, uh, there can be too much open space. The whole point of a city is that people live near, near one another and they benefit from that through these agglomeration efficiencies and so forth. Uh, so my hypothetical to you is uh, the south side of, uh, of, 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 of uh, Central Park is 59th Street. Uh, and suppose uh, the uh, people who governed uh, New York City had decided that they would turn everything north of, uh, of, of 59th Street into a park. Uh, this would be, uh, uh, I think, a great mistake. It would be too much park. Uh, the parks are good, but uh, too much too much of a park uh, is, is, in fact, a bad thing. And I, I, I mentioned some of this, uh, the neighborhoods, in fact, that would not, uh, uh, would not be available um, if uh, uh, New York had turned all of Manhattan uh, north of 59th Street into a park. And then my final slide, please, uh, Chelsea. The, uh, there are many ways of building housing. Uh, uh, and generally speaking, uh, there's a lot of international evidence that uh, governments don't do this too well. Uh, private markets have problems as well. I, I don't want to ignore those. Uh, but uh, this is an area where, in fact, uh, 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 the private sector, in fact, generally does better in producing housing than does uh, 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 that's a public sector. Uh, and there are examples, public housing in, in, in uh, uh, the US is a famous uh, a case of, of, of a system that has not worked very, very well. Um, uh, in uh, England, it's council housing. In, in France, it's HLM and so forth. There are lots of, uh, lots of evidence of this. So how to help a needy household? Uh, some people do need help at, at some point. Uh, there is a question about whether to use housing subsidies uh, at all, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, use having a gen more general income transfers. Uh, but uh, uh, forgetting about that issue, uh, uh, in, in general, uh, 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 most uh, housing economists agree that housing uh, uh, vouchers are superior to any form of project-based uh, assistance. Um, and um, uh, uh, they, they allow people to move, for example, uh, uh, when, you have, when you have a housing voucher, if you don't like how the landlord is treating, uh, 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 treating you, uh, you, can, you, can, you can exit. Uh, and that is, a, that, that is a great power. Uh, also for the taxpayer, uh, housing vouchers have been shown lots of studies that I can cite if somebody wants to inquire of me uh, are a lot cheaper uh, than uh, any form of project-based uh, assistance. So those are the end, uh, th those are the end of my remarks, and uh, I'm ready to look forward to uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Shockin's uh, uh, views on, on on these issues. Okay, I think I can, should I start my presentation? Absolutely, start when you're ready. Professor, you can um, share your screen whenever you're ready. You want to, can I start my video too? Sure, yes. So someone, it says uh, unable to start video. You will need to share your screen. Ah, okay. There you go.
Do you see my screen? I do. Okay. So first, thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Senator Chang, for inviting me to this conference. Um, I'm very excited. I haven't been, unfortunately, to Hawaii and uh, to Honolulu, but having uh, studied it a little bit for this conference, I think I'm missing quite a lot. So maybe I'll make the effort. Um, I think it's good morning to you over there. It's good night for us over here. So it's quite a difference and it's quite easy to uh, participate through the Zoom, but it's always much better to do it in person. Um, so I was asked to talk about why too much urban uh, open space is a bad thing. Uh, so I will, I will talk about it, and I think at the end of my talk, which will be a little longer than uh, uh, Professor Ellickson's, um, I think I'll, I'll answer this question. But before that, I need to talk a little bit about the city so that we understand the role of, of uh, uh, public space, public open space in the city. Um, I'll, I'll do this through a theory that I have been working on for, for the last 20 years, which I call the urban genome theory. And I think we'll explain quite a lot about the state of urbanism, both in, in, uh, in the United States, but also uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, in this slide, I'm showing you eight faces. Uh, on, on the right, uh, we, uh, we see four human faces, and on the left, we obviously uh, see uh, four, uh, four apes. Um, now, there is an interesting uh, phenomenon. There is a formula that produces humans and produces apes. It's called the genome. And the amazing thing about this uh, natural formula, if you like, is that while it produces a specific type of, of uh, specimen, uh, humans on one side, apes on the other, and any other uh, living entities uh, on Earth, uh, a little, uh, it's very specific for humans and it's very specific for apes. And uh, while it's a common uh, formula for all humans, there is no one single uh, uh, specimen that has been uh, uh, existing now or will be uh, uh, replicated. I mean, there is only one Robert Redford uh, there has never been a Robert Redford. There is no other Robert Redford and there'll never be a Robert Redford. So this, this is a, an important concept because I'm going to uh, share with you my uh, thinking. For some reason, it doesn't move. Um, let me see. Ah, now. Okay, here you see uh, four, uh, four photos, eight photos again. Um, the four on the right are what I call humans, and the four on the left is what I would call apes. Uh, the four humans are, uh, you can read that, it's Rome, Italy, Vienna, Austria, Buenos Aires in Argentina, and Osaka in Japan. I put these four because although they are, they belong to different cultures, different uh, continents, um, different periods of time, they share what I call the same genome. And the four on the left uh, share a different genome. Uh, I tend to call those apes uh, because they actually uh, represent a, 
a more difficult type of uh, urbanism and the much less successful type of urbanism. And you see the cities that are, are represented here are Brasilia in Brazil, Milton Keynes, which is a new town in the United Kingdom, Houston, Texas, part of Houston, and Ashdod in Israel. Um, the, uh, the, the common thing about the, the four on the right is that all of them were planned and built before 1960. And uh, the, the four on the left were all planned and built after uh, 1960. Now, again, my slideshow doesn't move. Um, oh. Well, um, when I am asked why, what happened in 1960, the only thing I can think about is that the uh, School of uh, Urban Design, the first school of urban design in the United States uh, was the Harvard um, uh, School of Urban Design, which was established in 1960. And I think it marks that date when, uh, when the world, um, the profession actually started thinking about planning and uh, uh, much like the story about the centipede, you know, they tell about the centipede that uh, he's been asked how he knows to move the uh, ninth leg after the eighth one, he begins to think, and since then he limps. And I think that's what happened to humanity about city planning and city building. Uh, cities are uh, thought of as, as a natural, uh, as uh, artificial artifacts. But in fact, I, I argue that uh, cities are the natural habitat of human beings. Uh, and they correspond directly to the characteristics of the human beings, which are very well summed up by Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which you see here, the, the pyramid, the famous pyramid. Um, and to sum up the pyramid, uh, you can tell that we need, in order to survive, we need, first of all, air. Without air, we cannot survive. And the next thing we need is contacts with other people. Because through contacts with other people, we can, we can fulfill our uh, safety needs, love and belonging, and esteem. Uh, and the city, the, the purpose of the city is to be a reservoir of potential contacts. And it's no wonder that the population of the world has been um, migrating to uh, urban environments uh, from early on in history to, to this present day uh, in, in a very, very large numbers and in a very fast and, and getting fa faster accelerated rate uh, all the time. Um, William White, the, the uh, New York uh, urbanist, said that what attracts people most, it would appear, is other people. I mean, we are willing to pay maybe 20 times more for a cup of coffee in a, sitting in a cafe than drinking the coffee alone at home because we want to be near other people, near other opportunities. Uh, we go to a concert to listen to music with many other people while we could sit at home using our stereo, high quality stereo and listen to the same music and uh, pay less and uh, uh, don't suffer the hassle of traveling to the concert hall and taking a babysitter and all that. And we still go to a concert because you like to be together with other people because as uh, White said, the thing that interests people most is other people. Uh, through this thinking, uh, I came to the definition of the city, a place where humans can physically interact at various levels of intimacy while remaining mostly anonymous. Now, I think uh, this, uh, this definition needs a bit of a explanation, especially because of the word anonym, anonymous, but I'll start with intimacy. Various levels of intimacy are 
like these, for instance. This is very high intimacy uh, in public space. This is another type of intimacy. This is less intimate intimacy, but still exists in public space. Also this uh, market in Rome and even uh, doesn't want to move now, wait a minute, okay. Sorry. There is some technical difficulties always. Um, I wanted to show you this one. Even this dagger uh, has some uh, relations in a level of intimacy with the passers-by. Uh, so the city is actually made of two types of spaces, private space and public space. And, and although I'm going to talk about too much space is a bad, uh, public space is a bad thing, I think public space is the most important element of the city because it's there that chance encounters with strangers are possible and are actually happening. So public space is any urban space one can pass through by chance and one goes to private spaces intentionally. And it's important to understand that. Uh, public space is not just uh, green parks or public squares. It's also the network of streets that we move, uh, that we move through for our uh, daily endeavors. Um, this is a diagram of a city, if you like, where the gray cubes are the private spaces and the white gaps between them are public spaces, uh, streets, alleys. Uh, the yellow part is a square and the green park represents, a, the green uh, square represents a park. And you can see that a, a person in point A who wants to move uh, to point B can choose a, of a number of different uh, routes to get, uh, to get there. He doesn't have to use the same route. For some reason, it's again stuck. Let's see if it will work now. Sorry for that. Okay, you see uh, the three, I'm throwing three chan uh, chance routes that uh, the guy, from the green guy with the dog can walk from A to B. And the lady from C to D can use her own different ways. The chances that they meet every day they walk from home to work uh, are very slim because they, there are many reasons they choose one day to, to uh, use this way and another day to use uh, the other way. So this structure of network of public spaces actually allows uh, people to be always uh, in the same space with people they don't know and, and form a reservoir of potential contacts. So conditions for the city is that one sees people in public space. When you walk in public space, there are people around you. Uh, one knows nothing or little about them because if you knew everything about them, you probably wouldn't be in a city, but would be in a small village. And uh, one spots potential destinations. Destinations are those places where you pass from public to private, like an entrance to a shop, an entrance to a house, etc. cetera. Um, so out of this, I devised uh, the urban genome indicators, and again, they, oh, here they come. Uh, the first one is public space allocation per person. It's the amount of public space allocated for each individual in the city. In my research, it's always should be under 10, 10 square meters per person. The network density is the number of junctions per kilometer, which should be over a hundred junctions per kilometer. If you know cities like Barcelona, for instance, is about, um, it's a grid iron of about uh, 100 junctions per kilometer. 
and the average destination distance uh, should be under 20 meters. That means the distance between entrances from uh, public to private. Uh, there's, oh, there's always the issue of density and here you see uh, a study of a, a, a major, this major triangular block in Paris. Paris is known to be a fairly dense, among the densest cities in the world, and also the, one of the most wonderful cities in the world. It has about 20,000 inhabitants per, uh, per kilometer. And here uh, I'm showing you uh, ways to achieve that density. One is building very densely low rise buildings that occupy the, uh, each block almost entirely. And the other one is using the same uh, uh, volume of buildings for each block, but with a single tower. But you see the difference between these two is that um, while in Paris you have about a thousand destinations in this block. In the alternative block of towers, you will have only 22 destinations. And that's uh, obviously much, much lower than uh, the uh, number needed. Now, later in the day, you will be shown a um, project in uh, Vancouver. And I, I'm using this project uh, because I've visited Vancouver a couple of years ago and I was extremely impressed by the way Vancouver managed to uh, create very high density and still uh, a wonderful uh, urban quality of life and the highest quality of life, urban quality of life that I've encountered almost anywhere else in the world. This is the Senac uh, project in Vancouver uh, which is basically uh, uh, a group of 11 towers uh, in, that create uh, a, a public space allocation per person of uh, about 25 square meters, which should be, according to my research, less than 10. Uh, this is the way the project looks. You see it's about 11 or 12 towers um, uh, spread out in the open, in a rather open space. Um, in the, 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 there is plenty of uh, green open space next to this project. Now it doesn't move again. Uh, okay. And the public open space there looks a bit like this, um, mostly empty. It's very large and you hardly see anybody there. Uh, while in the downtown of, uh, of Vancouver, uh, there is a, a tower development in the downtown of Vancouver, but there, there they devised a type of building that on the street level has uh, townhouses uh, at the base of the towers. You can see uh, in these pictures, the street, which is green, pleasant to walk in. Uh, it has entrances to private houses and entrance every eight meters or so when I, I counted there. And you can see this tower here on the aerial photograph. Uh, the average destination distance in this uh, development is about 15 meter. Um, and the public space uh, next to it, this is the, the tower I, I showed you out there here and this one here. And you see people around you and, and uh, you can still have a space for yourself, but you are not alone. And there is a chance that you will meet other people. Uh, in Hawaii, I haven't, as I said, I haven't been to Hawaii but I used Google Earth to try and study the place. And I found on the left in the center of Hawaii streets that mix people and, and, and vehicles and uh, seem to have a correct public space allocation per person while on a, the, a little bit outside of the center, uh, the area looks 
more like it's planned for cars and not for people. And it's not surprising that you hardly see any people walking there. Uh, in the same neighborhood, I looked into the uh, public spaces and they seem to be quite uh, open and uh, I, I would feel quite unpleasant uh, staying in a space like this where uh, there are not so many people around. And if I have to be alone, I would take my car and travel a little bit outside of the city and enjoy the wonderful green greenery that is surrounding uh, uh, Honolulu. Uh, and here is a lovely public spaces in the center of town where there is plenty of green, plenty of space and plenty of people and uh, extremely uh, happy situation. Uh, this is the one before last slide. I took the liberty to look into this neighborhood. It's the, I think the Macaulay. Uh, Mo Molili is this the way you, you call it? A neighborhood which is a bit off the center of the city. Uh, I, I studied it uh, in detail and found out that it has about 4,000 uh, dwelling units and about 33 square meters per person uh, uh, public space. And public space, as I said, includes parks, streets, squares, etc. Um, if, if you need to um, tackle the, the issue of your shortage of housing and you don't want to encroach on your open spaces, they're, they're, I think the one wise way to go about is to densify your existing uh, urban fabric. And doing that, you can still keep, uh, or not only keep, but in fact enhance the quality of life, the quality of urban life in uh, the existing neighborhoods. And such, a, such an exercise would look like this. It will have uh, base units of lower uh, buildings and towers above, just like I showed you in Vancouver. And you can see that just in this development, uh, uh, we added approximately 17,500 uh, uh, more units and the uh, public space allocation is reduced to four and a half square meters per person which is within the limits of, uh, of uh, what I found in my research for high quality urbanism. And uh, this, I leave you with that and hope to, uh, to answer your questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shokin and Professor Ellickson. I think we have time for a few questions. So just a quick reminder, we're gonna use that Q&A feature in the bottom right corner to ask questions. Please be sure to let Evan know who you're posing your question to. Evan, do we have some questions for our panelists? Thanks, Lynn. Yes, we do have some questions for our panelists. Uh, the first question uh, will actually be addressed to uh, both of our panelists from uh, this first presentation. I know each of you mentioned it briefly, uh, but there still seems to be some people wondering. Uh, there's agreement that, you know, we want some degree of open space, but we're not sure of how, what is too much. So would each of you say there is a, a gray line on this or is it a gray area? Uh, how would you define what be, when something becomes too much open urban space? Robert, you want to start? Okay, maybe I'll, I'll tackle the... Uh, I, I think for me, uh, too much uh, open space is a situation where I walk in, in, in a street or I uh, walk in a park or I uh, uh, sit in a square and there's nobody around when I feel alone. 
uh, it's just like I don't like to go into an empty restaurant. Uh, I don't like to be in an empty uh, uh, public space. And that's true for streets as well as parks or squares. Um, uh, I do just want to repeat uh, the point that I made that uh, op some open space is essential. Uh, cities would be unlivable uh, without some open space. Uh, but to recur to my example of Central Park um, uh, is uh, there can be too much open space and uh, therefore uh, uh, the, the preservation of everything north of 59th Street in, the, in Manhattan uh, would have been a, a great mistake. Um, uh, so uh, just repeating uh, the, the, my fundamental po points that I made earlier. Thank you. Uh, one more question, uh, which I believe each of you can, uh, can answer. Uh, Carla Mays is wondering, how has the pandemic, if at all, affected our views of the optimal levels of density in our communities? Well, I, I think the, uh, the, the issue of the pandemic and, and the public space actually uh, occurred all over. And I think, I think the issue is because of, a, a, I think uh, we are sometimes mixing um, urban density with housing density. Uh, and it, these are two extremely different things. Um, there are, you know, that in, in Mumbai, there are about six and a half meters per person housing, while in Manhattan, there are about 65 square meters per person housing, which means that people living together in very crammed uh, situations can and probably do uh, affect each other uh, with, with the virus. Uh, in public space, in public open space, um, the, the, the urban density that I'm recommending still leaves a lot of air between people. It's not that people are crammed in the park. You've seen the, the photographs of the park in, in, uh, in Vancouver, for instance. Uh, these are wonderful places. You can be there. Uh, around yourself, enjoy the open space. Um, and I don't think you have any higher chances of uh, uh, infect, infectious uh, th than in, in any other bigger open space. So uh, I, th I think public uh, open space is not uh, an issue on, on, on the pandemic. The, the other issue is that we found out I don't know if it happened to you in, in Hawaii, but in Tel Aviv, for instance, when we had our, uh, we had to be blocked at home, uh, we could move around only a hundred meters away from home. And we found out that in the center of town where everything is near, uh, within a hundred meters, you almost have everything you need for your daily life. But if you live in a suburb, which is uh, and far away from each other, and the shops are away, uh, you, you get into trouble when you need to travel further uh, in order to, to get your everyday uh, needs. Uh, this is Bob Ellickson. Uh, uh, the pandemic, of course, has, is another reason why uh, people uh, avoid cities. Uh, uh, how much uh, permanent effect this will have on urbanization and so forth is too early to tell. Uh, my own guess is uh, that if, assuming the pandemic passes uh, is that it will not have a great deal of effect. Uh, again, uh, people uh, by and large like density as, as, as William White, who uh, Professor Shokin uh, quoted, uh, 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 people uh, like to be with other people. Uh, they go to they go to concerts to use one of his examples uh, in order to uh, even though they have a good stereo at home uh, because they like the social um, uh, social experience. 
Uh, so there are a number of uh, disadvantages in live, to living in Honolulu. Uh, uh, there's more traffic uh, uh, and so forth, uh, but there are enormous advantages and uh, uh, agglomeration theory, I think, uh, gives a good explanation for why, uh, why this occurs. Awesome. Uh, thank you both for your answers to that. Uh, one other question uh, people are wondering from Carlos Anthony. Uh, how would you incorporate considerations around climate change and global warming uh, into pictures of development and urbanism? Uh, well, let me start first. Uh, I, I, I believe, of course, that climate change is a real thing uh, and that, that the it's a challenge to the uh, to, to the world. Um, uh, uh, how it how it uh, directly affects uh, uh, density uh, uh, in many ways. Uh, the sprawl that we see in the in many parts of the United States. I don't know whether this is true of Hawaii or uh, as well. Um, uh, uh, is in fact uh, quite bad for global warming uh, because uh, uh, compact uh, compact cities, uh, in fact, uh, use. Uh, they are much less automobile dependent, uh, and therefore, if you're concerned about uh, 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 global warming, uh, some density uh, is, is, is a good thing. Moving toward more density is, is, is a positive step. Yes, I, I agree. Uh, I agree with, uh, with Robert. Um, I think, in fact, the city is not a problem with relation to uh, global warming, but it's actually the solution. Um, the, the, um, the ecological footprint of a city, a real city dweller, is by far less than the ecological footprint of a suburb, uh, a sprawling suburb uh, um, person. Uh, because they, in a city, you can you can either use public transport or, or you can uh, walk. In uh, in suburbia, you only use your car, and uh, we know the effect of uh, of the car on on the environment. So, also uh, open spaces. They, they uh, in Hawaii, you have uh, so much forestry. Uh, greenery that absorbs the CO2, if you encroach on that, you, you instead of densifying your cities, uh, you actually uh, make the problems of, wa of uh, global warming much more severe. So the city is really the solution for global warming, not, not the problem. Agreed. Great, thank you again. Um, one other question, uh, or the question that many seem to be thinking about is uh, in communities like island communities, uh, do you think that we should be differing our development perspective at all? Or do we think that the same principles generally apply whether we are looking at an island community or uh, a larger uh, geographical area like on the US mainland and other countries? Well, I. I... I think uh, what I tried to say, maybe I didn't succeed that much to it, to demonstrate it. Um, the, the urban genome is universal. It relates to the human being, regardless of the fact whether he is from Honolulu or from, from India. Uh, it doesn't mean that cities in Honolulu will look like cities in India. They won't because a lot of other uh, environmental effects are different between uh, India and Honolulu. But, but basic, the basic concept, the basic genome of, the city, of a, an Indian city or a, an American city are the same. Uh, and that's why Buenos Aires and Rome follow the same, the same genome. So uh, yes, uh, uh, the city in in, in, uh, in Hawaii is not different from any other city anywhere else in the world. In fact, because Hawaii is such a wonderful 
uh, island and such a wonderful uh, natural landscape and natural habitat, uh, I think it would be wise to develop uh, uh, the human habitat as compact as possible. Uh, my own view is that uh, islands are not different, uh, that uh, housing markets, for example, uh, play out in Hawaii as well as, as everywhere else in the world. Um, uh, Hawaii, I think, in, since the 1960s, uh, before that, uh, uh, I think not, uh, but, but since the 1960s, Hawaii has uh, greatly over-regulated the production of housing. And, and uh, I congratulate Senator Chang for uh, making an effort to change uh, this uh, policy. Uh, the main thing we need in Hawaii is uh, more housing units, uh, regardless of uh, the, the price, uh, whatever, they will tend to bring down uh, the, the price of housing. And uh, uh, again, I refer you to the first, my first slide where I cite a few sources uh, that support that proposition. Thank you. Uh, Professor Ellickson, we actually have uh, a question very similar to the first slide where you mentioned that building any type or price level of housing uh, is an improvement and would be useful to a community. Uh, but many would seem to think that we should be focusing almost exclusively on building lower income housing. Uh, well, why do you think that any sort of housing construction uh, will end up helping a local market in the short or long term? Uh, I, I suggest that you refer to this article uh, that's, uh, that's available on SSRN uh, 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 by uh, Evan Mast about, uh, about the uh, beneficial effects even to uh, uh, lower income households uh, of, of, of more housing production, even of a, even of, of a, a luxury uh, uh, sort. Um, uh, uh, this surprises a lot of people, uh, it, but, but, but con not housing economists, uh, there's a concept of filtering uh, in housing markets that is well known to people. There's a technical issue about to what extent uh, housing markets are segmented uh, and therefore that uh, the production of, let's say, luxury housing does not benefit uh, a, a poorer people. Uh, there is a concern, of course, uh, that poor people uh, uh, can't afford uh, uh, much, uh, and uh, uh, as I suggested, uh, housing vouchers are the uh, be best way at a variety, for a variety of reasons uh, to take care of uh, that particular problem, not, not, not housing projects uh, where, uh, uh, and, and many of the uh, uh, efforts uh, to uh, provide housing for uh, low and moderate income families, in fact, do involve housing projects and that uh, that to me is a, is, a, is a definite inferior approach, very costly to the taxpayer. Uh, uh, it, it, it locks uh, people, in, in households into particular housing units that whose landlords, if they misbehave, uh, they can't do, they can't exit and so forth. Uh, so I'm just repeating some of the arguments that I made in my presentation. Okay, thank you both again. All good questions and excellent answers. This is a, com a couple of compelling um, presentations. We appreciate you being here. Um, and I, I think um, I wanna thank Evan too for his excellent moderation and for tossing those questions. Um, thank you everyone.